Well, good morning. Welcome, everyone. This is an open meeting of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board on October 10th, 2013. I want to welcome all of you uh, who've joined us today in person or listening in to the webcast of this meeting. Today, the Board will consider recommendations to adopt attestation standards for reports to be filed by brokers and dealers, an auditing standard on supplemental information accompanying financial statements, and related amendments to the other PCAOB standards. Uh, before we proceed with the agenda, I want to note for the record that all Board members are present. The first and only order of business to, before the Board today is a staff recommendation that the Board issue two releases, one adopting standards for attestation engagements related to broker-dealer compliance and exemption reports required by the Securities and Exchange Commission with related amendments to other PCAOB standards, and another adopting a new auditing standard for supplemental information accompanying audited financial statements with related amend amendments to other PCAOB standards. Um, to present the staff recommendation on this agenda item, I'll turn to our Chief Auditor's Office for the staff's presentation and our Chief Auditor, Mr. Bowman. Please proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Board. Uh, as you said, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we're here today to recommend that the Board adopt three important standards and related amendments, the first being the set of the two attestation standards relating to examinations and reviews of compliance reports of brokers and dealers that are required under the SEC's recently amended Rule 17A5. The second is the auditing standard you mentioned <coughs> that establishes requirements um, that apply when an auditor of the financial statements is engaged to report on supplemental information accompanying the financial statements, including the supplemental schedules of broker-dealers required by SEC's Rule 17A5. These standards were first proposed on July 12, uh, 2011. Joining me today to discuss these standards are Keith Wilson, Deputy Chief Auditor, and Barbara Vanich, Associate Chief Auditor. They will highlight key aspects of the standards shortly. On July 30, 2013, the SEC adopted amendments to Rule 17A5 to strengthen and clarify broker and dealer annual financial reporting requirements and also facilitate the ability of the PCAOB to implement the oversight of independent public accountants of brokers and dealers provided by the Dodd-Frank Act. When we first proposed these standards, I included in my remarks a quotation that Commissioner Aguilar made when the SEC first proposed its amendments to the SEC Rule 17A5. He said, it was estimated that customer securities positions held by just the four largest broker dealers total several trillion dollars. Furthermore, our own internal research has indicated that the top 200 broker dealers have over 100 million customer accounts. These numbers highlight the importance of the standards we are addressing today. The attestation standards we're asking the board to approve focus on furthering the protection of customers by, among other things, explicitly requiring the auditor to test the existence of the customer assets held by brokers or dealers who maintain custody of customer funds or securities, to consider the risk of fraud, including the misappropriation of customer assets, and to consider the risk of noncompliance associated with related parties, including investment advisors or others with whom the broker-dealer as a custodial or clearing arrangement. These attestation standards are closely aligned with the auditor's responsibilities in the SEC's amendments to Rule 17A5. Also, the requirements in the attestation standards are closely related to the information included in the, in the supporting schedules for broker-dealers, and therefore, we emphasize in the standards the importance of coordinating the work in the attestation engagement with the audit of the financial statements and audit procedures performed on the supplemental schedules. Let me turn very briefly to the separate auditing standard we are asking the Board to adopt today. Auditing standard number 17 provides requirements for performing audit procedures on the supplemental information accompanying audited financial statements, which would include the broker-dealers supporting schedules of net capital and of the computation for determining the customer reserve requirements. The information presented in these schedules is critical to a broker-dealer's compliance with the SEC rules designed to protect customer funds and securities. 
The development of the attestation and the auditing standards has been a significant effort, led by Keith Wilson and Barbara Vanich. In addition to Keith and Barbara, I want to acknowledge the work of Nick Grillo and Karen Burgess in the Office of the Chief Auditor for their extraordinary efforts in the development of these standards. I also express great appreciation to Jennifer Williams in the Office of General Counsel and to our colleagues in inspections, enforcement, and research and analysis for their valuable contributions. Finally, I'd like to thank the staff of the Securities and Exchange Commission who provided timely and helpful assistance and advice. I'll now turn it over to Keith and Barbara to present our recommendations. Thank you, Barney. Mr. Chairman and board members, these three standards before you today represent a milestone in the board's implementation of its authority over auditors of SEC registered broker dealers. With the SEC's recent amendments to its rules for broker dealer reports, audits of broker dealers will be performed under PCOB standards beginning with June year ends next year. This includes the audit of the broker dealer's financial report, in, which contains financial statements and supporting schedules that are the subject of AS number 17. Also, auditors will begin performing one of two new attestation engagements, either an examination of statements in the broker dealer's compliance report, if they cl carry or clear securities for customers, or a review of the broker dealer's exemption report. Although there's some commonality in the auditor's responsibilities under pre-existing SEC rules, the new engagements established by the SEC's amendments require changes to the auditor's work and reports. The SEC made the threshold decision to require broker-dealers to file either a compliance report examined by an auditor or an exemption report reviewed by an auditor. The SEC's release accompanying their amendments explains the rationale and the economic analysis in, behind their decision for the new reports and the changes to the auditor's responsibilities. Our focus was to develop examination and review standards that meet the SEC's requirements while being sensitive to economic considerations. We've worked closely with the SEC staff in this effort. The new standards set forth the reporting required by the SEC's rule and the procedures necessary to support the auditor's reports. These tailored standards should promote more consistent compliance with the SEC's rules. Similarly, auditing standard number 17 sets forth the requirements for the auditor's report on the supporting schedules required in the broker-dealer's financial reports, along with the procedures to support the auditor's opinion on that information in relation to the financial statements. While these three standards are designed for compliance with the SEC's rules, all of the standards share certain features that should help mitigate costs associated with the rule changes. First, they're scalable so that the necessary audit effort depends on the broker-dealer size and complexity. A large, complex carrying and clearing broker should require more audit effort than a small, non-complex, non-carrying broker. Second, they're risk-based to direct the auditor's attention to the areas of greatest risk. And finally, they require coordination of the work among the financial statement audit, the audit procedures on the supporting schedules, and the examination or review. This coordination can produce better quality audit work, and avoid duplication of effort. For example, in an audit of a broker-dealer that holds customer securities, the auditor test com is required to test compliance with the rules on net capital reserve, controls over compliance with those rules, supporting schedules detailing information about net capital and reserves, and the related financial statement disclosures. If properly planned and executed as called for by our standards, the auditor can perform a coordinated set of procedures that meet all the objectives for those areas, which is more effective and efficient than doing the work in silos. In developing these standards, we also tried to use principles and concepts from existing standards, such as the board's existing attestation standards and the auditing standards on audit evidence and testing controls, which should already be familiar to auditors. This, too, should help promote consistent auditor compliance and assist the transition to the new standards. Now, Barb Vanich will discuss the individual standards. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and board members. As Keith mentioned, today I'll provide you with an overview of each of the standards for which we are seeking your approval today, starting with an overview of the attestation standards. Both the examination and review standards draw from the principles and concepts in AT Section 101, 
or AT Section 601, but are tailored to these particular engagements. Both standards include a requirement to coordinate the examination or review with the audit of the broker-dealer's financial statements, including audit procedures performed on supporting schedules of net capital and customer reserves. The examination standard would apply when an auditor is engaged to perform an examination of certain assertions in a broker-dealer's compliance report. The compliance report is required by SEC 17 rule 17A5 and includes assertion by the broker-dealer regarding the effectiveness of its internal controls over compliance, both throughout and as of its year end, an assertion regarding compliance with net capital requirements and certain customer reserve requirements, and an assertion that the information the broker-dealer used to determine that it was in compliance was derived from its books and records. The examination standard includes procedures that parallel certain procedures in the audit risk assessment standards, which should allow for effective coordination with the audit of the financial statements. The examination standard also includes certain factors the auditor should consider in planning and performing the examination engagement, including considerations of fraud risk, particularly misappropriation of customer assets. The examination standard also requires that the auditor test the broker-dealer's compliance with the net capital rule and certain customer reserve requirements, which includes obtaining evidence about the existence of customer funds or securities held for customers and to perform tests of broker-dealers' internal control over compliance both throughout and as of year end. The examination standard reflects changes from the proposed standard to conform to the final amendments to SEC Rule 17A5, including reflecting changes made to the assertions in the objective of the standard and in the reporting requirements. The SEC narrowed the compliance assertion from testing compliance with four rules to testing compliance with the net capital rule and certain customer reserve requirements. So while the proposed examination standard required the auditor to test compliance with, with the four rules, the examination standard now includes more tailored procedures to test compliance with the net capital rule and the relevant customer reserve requirements. Other changes have been made to reflect the SEC's elimination of the concept of material noncompliance due to the narrowing of the compliance assertion. SEC Rule 17A5 in this standard do not require an audit of internal control over financial reporting and also do not require the auditor to an express an opinion on the <coughs> broker-dealer's process for arriving at the conclusions in its assertions. The examination standard includes procedures regarding communication of instances of noncompliance and deficiencies in internal control over compliance in addition to those required by the SEC Rule and also includes report requirements to address changes in the SEC's rules which differ from the reporting language historically used for broker-dealer audits before the most recent SEC amendments. Under the examination standard, the auditor would express an opinion on the broker-dealer's assertions. Turning to the review standard, consistent with SEC Rule 17A5, the review standard would apply when an auditor is engaged to perform a review of the broker-dealer's assertions that it claimed exemption from the SEC's rule regarding customer protection, reserves, and custody of assets, and that it met the exemption provisions without exception, or that it met the exemption provisions except for the exceptions described in its report. These assertions reflect changes from the SEC's proposed amendments, including the requirement for the broker-dealer to include a list of exceptions to the exemption, exemption provisions in its ex exemption report. The review standard has been modified from the proposed review standard to conform to the final amendments made to SEC Rule 17A5, <coughs> including updating the assertions to be included in the broker-dealer's report in both the objectives and reporting requirements in the review standard. The review standard establishes requirements that are designed specifically for the review required by SEC Rule 17A5, which enable the auditor to conclude on the broker-dealer's assertions. These procedures include reading the broker-dealer's exemption report to determine that the exemption conditions under which the broker-dealer asserts its exemption and the identified exceptions to the exemption provisions by performing inquiries and other review procedures included in the standard and evaluating whether evidence indicates there should be modifications to the broker-dealer's assertions based on the results of the procedures performed. The extent of inquiries and other review procedures will vary based on relevant factors, including the broker-dealer size and complexity. 
The review standard also includes requirements for communication and reporting similar to the examination standard but specific to the review. I would now like to briefly discuss the more notable amendments to other PCOB standards we are asking you to approve today. The amendments include changes to several existing PCOB auditing standards to clarify the applicability of those standards and their requirements in the context of the examination or review. Most notable are the amendments to auditing standard number seven on engagement quality review. AS7 applies to audits of financial statements prepared pursuant to PCOB standards and would therefore be required for audits of broker-dealers ending on or after June 1, 2014, which is the effective date for the corresponding SEC requirements that audits of broker-dealers <coughs> be conducted pursuant to PCOB standards. The amendments would require an engagement quality review and concurring approval of issuance for the examination and review engagements discussed today. Because the amendments apply only to an attestation engagement performed in, in conjunction with an audit of the financial statements, the requirements are significantly less detailed than the EQR requirements for an audit, since generally considerable overlap of the matters that are most important to the audit and attestation engagement would exist. Said another way, knowledge gained through performing the EQR procedures on the audit should inform the EQ reviewers' procedures on the exam or the review. In addition to the attestation standards, we are also asking the board to approve today a new auditing standard on auditing supplemental information accompanying audited financial statements, which would replace AU Section 551. The standard would apply when the auditor of the financial statements is engaged to perform audit procedures and report on whether supplemental information accompanying the financial statements is fairly stated in all material respects in relation to the financial statements as a whole. The standard defines supplemental information within the scope of the standard to include, for example, the supporting schedules that brokers and dealers are required to file pursuant to SEC Rule 17A5. Under the standard, the objective of the auditor is to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence to express an opinion on whether the supplemental information is fairly stated in all material respects in relation to the financial statements as a whole. When planning and performing the audit procedures to report on supplemental information, the auditor generally should use the materiality considerations as those used in planning and performing the audit of the financial statements. The standard provides factors for the auditor to consider in determining the nature, timing, and extent of procedures necessary to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence, as well as requirements for testing the supplemental information. These requirements include, among other things, determining that the supplemental information reconciles to the underlying accounting or other records or to the financial statements as applicable, and performing procedures to test the completeness and accuracy of the information presented to the extent it was not already tested as part of the audit of the financial statements. Further, the standard includes requirements regarding evaluating the audit results to determine whether the supplemental information, including its form and content, is fairly stated in all material respects in relation to the financial statements as a whole. Determining whether supplemental information is fairly stated includes determining whether it is presented in conformity with the relevant regulatory requirements as applicable. Lastly, the standard provides reporting requirements which retain the opinion language from AU Section 551 about whether supplemental, is, supplemental information is fairly stated in relation to the financial statements as a whole However, there are some differences in the reporting language, primarily because the supplemental information in SEC filings typically is presented pursuant to the requirements of the SEC or another regulatory body. This concludes our remarks today. Accordingly, the staff recommends that the board issue the releases before them, which would adopt attestation standard number one, attestation standard number two, auditing standard number 17, and the related amendments to PCOB standards in substantially the form attached and instruct the staff to submit the standards to the United States Securities and Exchange Commission for approval pursuant to Section 107 of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. We would now be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manich. Um, I have a written statement that I'm going to submit to the record in, in uh, the interest of not going over again this, the excellent summary you provided, but I do want to say that I'm very pleased to support 
adoption of this rule, and I'm particularly pleased that we're in a position today to adopt these final standards and attestation standards in accordance with the schedule and the, uh, the, the requirements of the SEC New Rule 17A5. Uh, a brief comment or two on the examination and the uh, review requirements. As uh, Mr. Wilson has mentioned, uh, they're risk-based, uh, they are scaled, and they uh, require coordinated effort in the examination of the compliance reports. Um, this is very important. It's been a very important guiding principle of the board from the beginning, I think, in approaching the examination of the compliance reports that are so important to the policies that Mr. Bauman outlined in terms of the uh, of the risks for which these rules are intended to address uh, and and to remedy. Uh, it also requires auditors to use judgment to identify and focus on matters that are most important to the customer protection objectives of the engagements, and that has been at the, at the basis of our effort in the, um, in the examination of compliance reports and in the rules in the rules as a whole. On the review of the exemption reports, uh, we have been acutely aware that many of the so-called introducing brokers are small uh, operations, and for these brokers, the approach that you have taken in the reserve and custody of security, the, cu the customer protection provisions of 17 8, of 15 C3, and the uh, the ex review procedure you have uh, you have recommended, um, intends to take the size and complexity of the broker into account, as you mentioned, um, and the extent of those inquiries and uh, that they have to make, and the materials that they would have to review we think are naturally going to be less for a small, uncomplicated broker. Uh, these are not audits, and for those of us who are not auditors, it is particularly helpful to, um, to see the articulation of the difference between the compliance examination and the review of the exemption reports and to realize what you've done there. Uh, finally, uh, with respect to the uh, auditing the supplemental information, um, I am particularly struck by Ms. Vanish's uh, remark that uh, if, if supplemental information was already tested as part of the audit of the, of the financial statements, as uh, would be the case in many cases, the standard does not require additional testing. So you have, uh, you have laid out, I think, uh, the reasons why we have uh, had, a, had a particular view toward efficiency and cooperation and the use of, of good practice. Um, we have, uh, of course, been uh, aided from the insights and suggestions of commenters. Um, we want to promote useful pr protection of investor assets. We don't want to cause wasteful effort. I think these standards are a major step in that direction. They should do that. I have to note, though, going back to the Chief Auditor's introduction, that we have seen significant compliance problems even under the profession's existing standards through our interim broker-dealer auditor inspection program. Uh, the purpose of the interim program has been to gather information about the manifold differences in the activities of the spectrum of brokers and dealers whose audits could be subject to PCA only inspections in order to determine the scope and the elements of a permanent inspection program, which we're not doing today. But whether or not certain firms are ultimately exempted from the PCAOB's inspection requirement, whether we do reach some or achieve some standard or some basis for exemption, it's clear that many firms will need to significantly improve their work under any set of standards to meet the SEC's requirements and, more importantly, the public's expectations. Uh, I want to thank the SEC staff for their assistance in this project. Uh, the proposal benefits from extensive consultation and discussion with the SEC staff. Their insights have been invaluable, as usual. I want to thank again the Chief Auditor, Marty Bauman, uh, and his team, Keith Wilson, Barbara Vanich, Nick Grillo, Karen Burgess, as well as one of the newer additions to Marty's team, our economist, John Powers, who gives us uh, new depth and standard setting to bring economic tools and insights to bear in our rulemaking, as well as Saad Siddiqui in our Office of Research and Analysis. So um, readers of this, of this adopting release will see the, manifold, the manifest results of economic analysis being brought to bear on rulemaking. And finally, we always are well served and advised by our general counsel, Gordon Seymour, and his staff, and in this case, uh, Jennifer Williams. With that, I want to turn to uh, board member uh, comments and, and Mr. Harris. Steve? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I, I agree with you. I, I think that was an excellent overview uh, and description of the standards, and, and therefore I ask permission that my full statement be made a part of the record, uh, and I'll abbreviate it. Um, 
I, I also support the adoption of the standards before us today, and I view the board's adoption of these standards as another step toward forward in our oversight of the audits of brokers and dealers. Uh, a little over three years ago, uh, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act granted the board explicit authority over the audits of broker-dealers registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Without going or reiterating the requirements of these standards, I believe that they strike an appropriate balance between enhancing customer and investor protection and the regulatory impact of implementing uh, these new standards. As has been mentioned, these standards include requirements related to the auditor's consideration of fraud risks, including the risk of misappropriation of customer assets. By focusing on risk, the standards are intended to be scalable for audits of different types and sizes of broker-dealers. This is very important due to the diverse and complex operations of the over 5,000 SEC registered broker-dealers whose audits and reports will now be subject to PCOB standards. While the primary user of the financial statements and compliance or examination exemption reports of broker-dealers may be different from the users of issuers' financial statements, the objective is the same. Uh, to protect investors and customers by providing independent assurance that broker-dealers comply with certain financial <coughs> responsibility rules designed to enhance the protection of customer assets. These measures include requiring broker-dealers to maintain prudent levels of net capital and take steps to safeguard customer assets. Further, as noted in the Board's second report on the progress of its interim inspection program for auditors of broker-dealers, Inspection staff identified audit deficiencies in 57 of the 60 audits selected for inspection. The standards we are adopting today are tailored for the new audit and re reporting requirements in SEC Rule 17A5 and establish an approach that should provide greater clarity as to the procedures that should be performed by auditors and promote improved performance in the audits of broker-dealers. I'll have a number of questions, but in closing, I would like to join you, Mr. Chairman, and other board members in thanking Marty Bauman, Keith Wilson, Barbara Vanich, Nick Grillo, and Karen Burgess, as well as the staff in the Division of Registration and Inspections, the Office of Research, uh, Jennifer Williams, and the General Counsel's Office for their efforts in bringing these standards before the board today. As always, uh, we appreciate the contributions of the staff of the Securities Exchange Commission's Office of the Chief Accountants uh, and the significant collaborative efforts between our organizations uh, to reach today, this important day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And we will go to questions later. Let me, Mr. Ferguson. Okay. Yeah. I also support the adoption of attestation standards 1 and 2 and auditing standards 17. I also have a written statement that I'm not going to <coughs> read, and rather than reiterating what's been said, uh, simply to say that what has concerned me in the two years that I've watched us do interim inspections of audit of auditors and brokers and dealers. I've been concerned, as Steve Harris mentioned, about the serious deficiencies that we've discovered, finding deficiencies in 57 of the 60 um, audits we examined. And I believe these standards will go a long way to communicate clearly with auditors uh, what's required to perform a high-quality audit here. And given the critical importance of brokers and dealers to capital formation in this country, any improvements in audit quality is an important improvement for investors and customers of brokers and dealers who entrust those companies with their own funds. I'd also like to note that this has been a long-standing project of the board, but I also want to note that the staff here at the PCAOB, with support from the SEC, has worked intensely in the a past few weeks to enable us to adopt these standards as quickly as pol possible following the SEC's adoption of its Rule 17A5. And along with my colleagues, I'd like to acknowledge the extraordinary work that's been done on this by Marty Bauman and Barb Vanich, Keith Wilson, uh, as well as Karen Burgess and Nick Grillo, Jennifer Williams, and our other offices, and to thank the SEC staff for their work in helping us on this. Thank you, Board Member Hanson. Well, like my fellow board members, I also support this, and like them, I'm not going to read my entire uh, statement uh, that I will uh, submit for the record, but I'm just going to highlight a, a, a few things. Um, Broker-dealers are, are subject to extensive regulation, including the requirements for an annual audit, to protect customers and the operations of the securities market. The system of regulation and controls implemented by the SEC, FINRA, and other self-regulatory organizations helps to ensure that a customer's funds 
are actually invested in the company in which the cu customer wants to buy shares. The customer's request to sell shares are carried out as instructed, and the customer securities held by the broker actually exist. System of regulation includes, for example, requirements around a broker dealer's capital level uh, designed to ensure the safety and soundness of the entity. Likewise, certain broker dealers must maintain a reserve of funds or qualified securities that equals in, in value the amount of funds owed to the customers. Adequate capital and reserves may be necessary, for example, to provide a cushion when a market disruption occurs. Therefore, while a customer may not worry too much about the financial statements of a broker-dealer, whether or not the broker-dealer meets the regulatory requirements for minimum levels of capital and maintain adequate reserves is critical information. Uh, so I believe the standards today <coughs> that we are adopting um, appropriately reflect the requirements of SEC Rule 17A5 and provide a reasonable balance of investor protection and regulatory burden. More specifically, the standards redefine and strengthen the audit requirements applicable to the audits of brokers and dealers by requiring auditors to focus on the primary risks associated with the activities of the broker-dealers. With respect to the audits of the so-called carrying broker-dealers, those that maintain custody of customer funds or securities, the examination standard focuses on compliance by the broker-dealer with specific SEC rules related to net capital and reserve requirements. In addition, the auditor must understand and evaluate the broker-dealer's internal controls over compliance that are designed to prevent customer or investor losses of securities or funds in the hands of the broker-dealers. The activities of the broker-dealer that do not maintain customer funds or securities and therefore claim an exemption throughout the year are deemed to pose less risk. There, as a result, the review standard, which requires a lower level of assurance than an audit, mandates fewer procedures and requires the auditor to provide moderate assurance as opposed to reasonable assurance. The attestation standard uh, and AS-17 each contemplate the auditor will conduct a risk-based audit and permit the audit to be scaled based on the size and complexity of the broker-dealer or the supplementary information as applicable. Likewise, the standards contemplate that the auditor would leverage the work conducted on the financial statement audit in connection with the examination and review engagement and, and the audit of the supplemental information. Therefore, I believe the standard standards reflect an appropriate balance of customer and investor protection. The importance of co auditor compliance with these new standards cannot be overstated, particularly in light of the results uh, noted by my fellow board members uh, from our interim broker-dealer uh, authority, our, our auditor inspection program. So in the last two years, um, the, we looked at 83 uh, audits um, uh, combined between 2011 and 2012, audited by 53 firms, and in 80 of the 83, we found deficiencies. Many of these deficiencies involve audit procedures related to net capital and customer reserve supporting schedules, um, compliance with the conditions of the exemption, and the accountant's supplementary report on material inadequacies. Independence violation, primarily those involving auditors that were involved in the preparation of the broker-dealer financial statements were widespread, particularly among the smaller firms. While each audit firm in the business of auditing broker-dealers will have to consider its own return on the necessary investment to perform high-quality audits, in light of our inspection finding, findings, I urge all firms who, that choose to conduct broker-dealer audits to consider whether they need to make a fresh start. It's important that firms implement the new standards uh, be mindful of the, uh, and be mindful of the need for appropriate quality control processes, especially in the independence area, and provide robust guidance and training for their staff. Um, as uh, has been noted, this uh, what we're adopting today bears, uh, does not bear on whether we will ultimately uh, exempt some of the uh, uh, brokers and dealers from our um, uh, inspection regime. Uh, so we we yet we have yet to uh, determine that. So on the, the timing, uh, as has been noted by the staff, these are effective for uh, years ending after June 1, 2014. And, and I just will note that uh, time is of the essence uh, after the SEC approves um, uh, these rules that we're approving today that uh, the, the firms get uh, right at it for those uh, year ends uh, and ending in June um, to uh, implement the requirements. Finally, I note that the uh, work regarding the rules and standards for broker-dealer auditors is not done. In February 2012, we proposed a series of amendments to the PCLB rules and forms to reflect the Dodd requirements of the Dodd-Frank Act. These proposals included, for example, rule amendments tailoring the board's professional practice standards to the audits of brokers and dealers, as well as a series of other rules and form amendments related to auditors of broker-dealers. In order to make the transition for broker-dealer auditors to the new rules and standards as seamless as possible, the board needs to move quickly to adopt the final rule amendments as one of our highest priorities. 
I'd also like to thank um, the, the staff. Uh, they've uh, uh, been noted here, so I won't uh, repeat the name, but uh, very helpful and very uh, uh, diligent work to, to get us here um, by our own staff and general counsel's office, as well as the staff of the, the SEC. So I will turn it over to Jeanette. And we have time for some questions. Uh, Mr. Harris? Jeanette, Jeanette. Oh, Jeanette. Oh. <laughs> your, your fifth board member here. Doing um, <laughs> don't worry, I wasn't going to let you get away with that. Um, uh, I fully uh, support adoption of these standards and the amendments before us today. And uh, like my fellow board members, I'm not going to reiterate the requirements uh, of those. Uh, but I do want to commend the staff uh, for the approach taken on this project. Um, these attestation standards represent a tailored uh, approach uh, to the existing um, standards and the specific rules uh, within SEC's Rule 17A5. Um, and the standards also support the SEC's focus on broker-dealer practices and internal controls over compliance uh, with the financial responsibility rules, which are so important uh, to protecting customer assets. Um, and in particular, those rules that do involve safeguarding of customer securities and funds. And so I, I really commend the staff uh, for this approach. The new standards also incorporate requirements for risk assessment procedures, uh, specifically related to the risk of fraud, uh, including the risk of misappropriation of assets. Um, and the new standards are also designed to emphasize coordination uh, with the financial audit. Um, and there's been um, due consideration uh, for economic factors as well as scalability. So again, I compliment the staff uh, on this approach. With the adoption of these standards, oversight for broker-dealer audits will now involve the four major regulatory functions of the board, uh, registration, inspections, professional standards, and enforcement. Uh, the board had previously adopted rules uh, related to registration, uh, and as has been mentioned, we've had an interim inspection program to assess auditors' compliance with rules and standards uh, for audits of broker-dealers. Uh, unfortunately, as has been mentioned, the board's first two reports of summary inspection findings under the interim program have identified a disturbingly high rate of serious deficiencies in the financial statement audits that have been performed uh, under the generally accepted auditing standards of the AICPA. Uh, these inspections also identified a high level of noncompliance with other rules, such as audit procedures related to customer protection and net capital rules under the Exchange Act uh, and the SEC rules on auditor independence. I want to emphasize the need for auditors to take a fresh look at their audits of brokers and dealers in light of the significant weaknesses we've found in the audits under the old rules. Uh, these new rules and standards should provide an opportunity for auditors to refocus their efforts on audit quality in their work related to brokers and dealers so that they comply with SEC rules, PCAOB standards, and meet their basic responsibilities for providing assurance over broker-dealer financial information uh, and compliance with customer protection and other rules. As the release accompanying today's standards indicates, the Board will take action in the near future on other amendments to PCAOB rules uh, to conform them to provisions of Section 982 of the Dodd-Frank Act. Among other things, these amendments will clarify which auditing standards which interim auditing standards and other PCAOB professional standards will apply to these audits of brokers and dealers. So accordingly, the Board's upcoming adoption of these amendments will be an important factor in finalizing the professional standards and auditing requirements that will apply to broker-dealer auditors and their audits. Again, I want to compliment the staff uh, for all the hard work on this under very tight time frames. I think, given my gaffe, you get the first question. <laughs> well, no, I'm not prepared. Ah. <laughs> so now you're going to uh, switch up on In that case, Mr. Harris, yeah. Uh, uh, part of the rationale for Congress requiring the Board to adopt these standards uh, in Dodd-Frank uh, was to help prevent another Madoff uh, type scandal. And, and I, want, I would ask you to address a, a potential expectation gap. And the question is, how do you think that the new standards will help the auditor in addressing the risk of misappropriation of customer assets, and do you believe the, these standards will help to avoid another Madoff type situation? Uh, Steve, there are several requirements in the examination standard specifically that address the auditor's responsibilities 
uh, with respect to custom misappropriation of customer assets and protecting customer assets. And so one of them relates to the consideration of fraud risk. Uh, fraud risk uh, is a, an important consideration in protecting customer assets and in uh, looking, through, looking at that throughout the engagement. Uh, there are also audit procedures, the audit procedures performed on the supporting schedules, which include the net capital schedule and the customer reserve requirement schedule, should also uh, go a long way in protecting customer assets. Um, the, the fraud risk assessment uh, in particular is informed to a substantial degree by work the auditor does to consider fraud risks in the audit and uh, it sh should really focus the auditor on areas that are most important in the broker-dealer's audit. Um, other, other requirements also to test the existence of customer assets uh, are important in our view and, and go a long way in protecting customers. I'll just add that um, for for the benefit of people trying to understand and apply the standards, there is some considerable discussion in the release uh, that's uh, before you today that talks about that that very issue and and the way that the auditor would think about the fraud risk from from a number of different perspectives, given the the overall body of work that they're doing in an audit of a broker and dealer. And then would you describe, uh, you know, how our broker-dealer audit standards that are being proposed today are different from those of the AICPA standards that the auditors use presently? Uh, I just start out on that one. Um, I, I'd say, first of all, it's important to keep in mind that uh, the SEC's changed requirements in 17A5, so there's, there's different requirements now for brokers and dealers in what they're uh, reporting on and <coughs> making assertions about. And therefore, there's different requirements for, for auditors pertaining to that. Um, the, the former reporting by the auditors dealt with auditors providing reasonable assurance as to whether there were material inadequacies with respect to a variety of the SEC rules around uh, capital and customer assets, etc. However, the uh, assertions being made today by brokers and dealers are very specific about compliance with those specific rules and they have to report any instances of noncompliance. And our audit standards are very specific in directing the auditors to report on those assertions and to search for any instances of noncompliance. So our procedures are much more specific about the reporting requirements and the compliance requirements of the, of the broker dealers today. And so, so there's a vast difference in the framework between what auditors had to do before compared to what auditors have to do right now. I'll pass it along to Keith and others to Barbara to comment further. No, I, I think I think Marty responded well. I mean, it, it, it builds on concepts that pe people should be familiar with, but the specificity should should give very good guidance as far as getting to the right answer. Um, and, and like Marty said, the the requirements for the the reports are new, but auditors do have some familiarity with the rules that are, are covered. So the schedules aren't new, but but it tells them directly to perform test work that wasn't performed already as part of the audit. Thank you. Well, very Chairman important for auditors will be to read and understand the rules of the SEC on, under 17A5. That's an essential ingredient for them to be able to perform these compliance examinations is to understand those rules so that they can understand and, and direct their tests appropriately to make those, uh, to report on those assertions by the brokers and dealers. I'll have additional questions, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, I, this follows up a little bit on what Steve was asking, but I'd like you to, under AS17, I'd like you to focus for a minute specifically on supplemental information and to tell us what auditors, brokers, and dealers are doing today with respect to the audit of that information and how this new standard is going to change what they do um, in looking at supplemental information. Uh, the, the standard that auditors follow now to audit supplemental information is AUC Section 725 of the AICPA standard. And from a procedural perspective, it shouldn't be vastly different. That standard requires auditors to perform tests on the information and to evaluate the results of tests performed. The difference between that standard and our standard primarily relates to the focus on compliance with regulatory requirements including the form and content of regulatory requirements. And uh, we, we do have in Appendix 4 to that standard a more detailed discussion of the notable differences 
between our standard and the existing standard. Thank you. Mr. Hanson? I wanted to follow up on, um, on the comments you've made about the effective date and, and my comments about uh, uh, TikTok. Uh, it's essentially in effect for junior ends uh, right, right now, even though uh, we're just proving them today and the SEC has yet to prove them. Can you provide a little more context about the practical implications of, of, of uh, what an otter firm, what an otter should be doing, and, and, and also if, if we plan to do any other uh, things, uh, informal guidance on, on the transition um, um, this year? I'll start on that one and then I'll look to the others to supplement my comments. But uh, that is an important point that these, uh, the, the rules of the SEC with respect to uh, broker dealers are they have to comply with the new requirements in 17A5 in connection with their reports as of uh, fiscal year's end, June 1st, uh, 2014. And so therefore our standards for auditors are consistent with that, that for audits of financial statements, supplemental information, or these attestation engagements in connection with uh, reporting as of June 1st, 2014. Um, given the, what we've also said in connection with the uh, problems that have been seen in our inspection programs, uh, there's a lot of work that auditors, broken dealers, have to, have to do. Those auditors, first of all, have to assess what are the problems in existing procedures that they have. Uh, they then, as I mentioned a moment ago, they really have to dig into the SEC rules and understand the changes that were made into 17A5. Then they have to look carefully at our standards and understand the new requirements to perform specific procedures regarding these assertions, specific procedures regarding supplemental schedules, and then get to understand PCAOB auditing standards as well, which differ in many respects from AICPA auditing standards. So they have to look at their, their methodologies and uh, update their methodologies, make important changes, improvements in many areas, as we've talked about, because of existing deficiencies as well as new rules. So um, I, I strongly encourage auditors, as, as others on the board have, to pay attention to this promptly, uh, to look at their methodologies, improve them, uh, understand uh, changes in the rules, and, uh, and uh, don't take any time out in connection with getting started on this very important task. And, and I would just add a, a couple of points. One, I guess, um, as been mentioned, given the level of deficiencies that, that have been identified so far, I guess I'd be remiss in saying that there are some, there, there's a, quite a number of broker-dealer audits that are going to be done on 1231 year ends this year and for people not to take their eye off the ball and and um, look past that that very important milestone they need to do good audits now um, also adding to to something Marty said about the importance of of looking very carefully and understanding the SEC's rule changes extremely important there are uh, beyond 17A5, there were some important changes to some of the financial responsibility rules that become effective this month that will affect audits right away. So that they'll need to be very focused on those. And um, depending upon you know where the year ends that their company that their clients have, uh, they're going to need to be thinking about the transition. The, the clearing and caring brokers are going to have to report on compliance. Um, it, uh, on internal control over complaints for an entire year. So for some of those, if they have junior ends, they're this, that's this year we're talking about now. So they would be wise to start talking if they haven't already been talking to their clients about that, um, making sure that they have a plan, how they're going to be able to test compliance or internal controls for that year and that make sure there's evidence there for them to be able to do that testing and to think about that. Uh, as to guidance, your, your other point, we are, we are definitely um, looking very seriously at that, uh, trying to uh, decide uh, is, is there a need for guidance, what kind of guidance do we, w might we provide, and, um, and when, when might be the, the optimal time for that. So that's something that the staff is spending a considerable amount of time working, working on right now. We have, of course, an active small business outreach program, which has included over the last two years, year and a half, a number of, of small business forums on not only our, our small business uh, uh, education and information generally, but also focused in some instances on broker-dealers. Um, Jay and Jeanette have both been uh, very active 
in staffing and in leading those those meetings and those fora. We're of course going to plan continue to do that in the months going forward. We have a we have an expanded uh, an expanded uh, set of public meetings planned. Uh, Ms. Ranzel. <laughs> Thank you. I also had a number of questions and concerns about the transition because this represents a big change, uh, especially given uh, the current state of audits in this area. So um, just to continue on this theme, uh, what specific steps do you suggest that auditors take now uh, to become knowledgeable about the new reporting and audit requirements, and what should they be communicating to their clients because their audit clients also have changed requirements? Um, well, uh, some of that piggybacking what we've, we've said, that um, absolutely start with the rules, um, the, the changes to 17A5, uh, the new changes to the financial responsibility rules, those are things that are going to need, they're going to need to understand and understand quickly and to think about exactly how that's going to apply to their practice. Uh, certainly taking a look at these standards would be very important the implications for what they'd be required to do and, and starting to have those serious conversations with their clients about transitioning and what kind of work the auditor is going to need to be starting to do and what the implications are because the broker and dealer has to start with these new reports. They haven't had to provide an exemption report or, or re assert compliance with in the compliance report so um, they, need to under the, they need to have sort of a common understanding of what what the broker dealer is going to report on, and what the what the auditor is going to be doing, and and a conversation about you know the kinds of evidence the auditor is going to need to to be able to uh, do the work that's going to be required under the SEC's rule and these standards. Just uh, adding some further thoughts, and we've touched on this a bit also, uh, the fact that this requirement is to report on internal controls over compliance, not only as of the year end, but throughout the year. Um, that is an important aspect of the SEC's requirements and, and therefore our auditing, our attestation standards go to that. Um, auditors uh, should be familiar with testing controls throughout the year. They do financial statement audits and if they're going to rely on controls, they need to know that those controls are operating throughout the year. So they're, they're familiar with, with doing that. They're not necessarily familiar with issuing reports on controls throughout the year. Uh, even AS5 on reporting on controls over financial reporting is as of year end. Um, so, so this is different in that respect. And so methodologies, again, are very important for the firms to look at their methodologies and how they test controls now generally when they're going to rely on them throughout the year, but now testing compliance controls and these specific rules under 17A5 and building in methodologies to ensure that they, they do this appropriately and issue a report that's uh, consistent with the requirements and the standards. Well, and I would also imagine that in some cases, uh, auditors will be faced with uh, situations where the clients were not able to or didn't uh, get up to speed under the new rules, and then there will be some more difficult uh, audit decisions to make under those uh, cases. In this transition year, that would be particularly important as uh, clients have to, companies have to have the evidence in place for the auditors. And, and uh, that's, uh, that was mentioned, I think, before that auditors should be speaking to their clients early and often. Are there other questions for Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, could you talk a little bit about this, the scalability of these standards and then uh, what you believe will be the impact of these standards on smaller broker-dealers and, and specifically uh, how you respond to the concerns that have been expressed by some that uh, the standards may drive some smaller firms out of business and, and what are we doing to mitigate those concerns? Sure, I'll start at least with the scalability part. Um, so while the examination standard includes requirements to test compliance and to test internal controls over compliance both throughout the year and as of year end, the extent of the test work is really going to depend on the complexity of, of the broker-dealer. For example, while the net capital rule, the, the broker-dealer has to assert to compliance and internal controls over compliance with the net capital rule, certain provisions of the net capital rule only apply to certain types of broker-dealers. While there are some provisions that apply to all and, and very complex broker-dealers, 
um, would likely have to consider more provisions and therefore the, the testing would be more extensive. Um, the review standard, which will be the standard in play for many of these smaller broker dealers who claim exemption from the rules, uh, to the extent it's a very <coughs> small operation, it'll just likewise take less time to, to do the necessary test work. So the, the reading of various regulatory reports and inquiries when you have a limited number of employees and people involved in the compliance function will just naturally take, take less time. Yes, I have a question. Uh, I know that uh, these standards will require changes to other rules of ours, conforming changes. This is a project we're working on. It's a two-part question. One, could you give us some sense of the timing of when we would expect to adopt conforming amendments? And do you force, in the interim before that is done, do you foresee problems or difficulties in complying with the new rules, given the fact that the existing PCOB rules don't necessarily conform with, in, in all respects, with what the new rules require? Uh, sure, let me try to take that. Uh, you, uh, as has been alluded to, this is a project that has been working on, on for some time. The board proposed these rules. Uh, last year, we, we hope to be in a position to recommend the board adopting final rules on the subject later this year with the goal of having them be effective in the spring. Um, we, I don't foresee confusion or concern, but as Keith alluded to earlier, if there were questions about the standards coming up to the effective date of the, uh, the new regime, uh, the staff may put out uh, a guidance on that subject. Mr. Hanson, um Question about the supplemental information standard, and, and uh, you, you'd stress that the uh, opinion um, on the supplemental inf information, including the, like the net capital statement, is um, uh, effectively an audit opinion, but it's in relationship to the in relation to the financial statements um, a as a whole. If you can just expand a little bit more on what that means, uh, practically what that means. Um, the. In relation to is is a concept that that we've really carried forward from the um, the pre-existing standards that we've had, and what it what it essentially means is that the auditor approaches the approaches the information and and what the way they think about materiality, which which drives scope and drives their evaluation, is is um, they apply the, the same kinds of materiality considerations that they do for the audit of the financial statement. So instead of looking at each schedule on sort of standalone basis and trying to, to think about errors that would be material to that schedule, then they're thinking about uh, the, the scope of their works based on looking for reasonable assurance about information that would be material at the level of the financial statements as a whole, which I think is generally recognized, and, and our, even our standards say is, is would be a considerably different measure. But, but in, on an individual basis, it would be a much lower level of, of materiality and require a lot more audit effort. Okay. You know, the thought in that regard is that um, it is important to, to recognize, though, that the, the assurance that is being given on that supplemental information is the same level of assurance on the financial statements taken as a whole, and that is the auditor is providing reasonable assurance and rendering an opinion on the that, that's fairly stated in relation to those financial statements taken as a whole. So it is the same level of assurance with generally the same materiality level in, in mind. Okay. I want to follow up a little more on the upcoming conforming amendments. Um, what is the substance of how those amendments will impact broker-dealer audits? Conforming amendments will have some impact on the professional standards, but in general, the, the auditing standards will not be affected by the conforming amendments. So which professional standards will then be applied through these conforming amendments? Well, that's a matter that the board, I guess, will have to decide here and later this year. We've proposed, I guess, that uh, a number of the, the rules and um, in its professional standards apply, except the, the rules dealing with uh, pre-approval, uh, audit committee pre-approval, and a few other um, rules. So I guess we'll need to take that up soon. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. And a draft, I guess it should be noted, a draft of these conforming amendments are now in the hands of the board. 
um, after considerable work by the general counsel, and they are a complete, they are a very complete detailed set of uh, amendments. They're available now to, to be looked at and considered. Uh, there will also be discussion, as there always is, with the SEC staff about the details of those conforming amendments. Are there other questions? I have a final question, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, and that is that the attestation standards, quote, emphasize coordination between the examination engagement or review engagement, the audit of the broker's or, or dealer's financial statements and audit procedures performed on the supporting schedules. And this emphasis on coordination when properly executed can promote overall audit effectiveness and avoid unnecessary redundancy in, in the work performed, close quote. Uh, would you describe in a little bit more detail the type of coordination uh, you envision, uh, and I assume that you anticipate this coordination together with scalability uh, will help to contain costs related to the audit? Sure, we envision coordination in a couple of ways. So, so really throughout the process, in planning the engagements, in performing the engagements, and in evaluating the results. In, in a number of cases, there will be overlap of what's covered in any financial statement disclosures, what's covered in supporting schedules, and what's covered in the compliance work, both for the compliance assertion and in the assertions over internal control over compliance. The, the easiest example is the work done on the uh, around the net capital rule, and so uh, it's often disclosed in the financial statements, <clears throat> and so the auditor would perform procedures on the disclosure. There's a supporting schedule of net capital, which would fall under the, the supplemental information auditing standard, and so the auditor would perform procedures to the extent they didn't already cover things. And then the net capital rule <clears throat> is subject to both the compliance assertion and the internal controls over compliance. So you're testing controls and then also compliance with the rule. And so rather than look at each one of those engagements or pieces individually, you could look at them holistically and plan the work so that you meet the, the uh, objectives of, of the various engagements and what you need to do at one time, that probably have much more effective procedures and, and audit work being performed and, and also saving time and, and not uh, duplicating effort. There'd be much greater risk of error or instances where an auditor didn't find uh, the problems that they should. If, if you think of it, if, if three different teams went off independently and did the compliance exam, the financial statement exam, and the supplemental schedules, um, where, where they, what one team learned, the other one didn't know, if this is integrated together, uh, compliance, financial statements, supplemental information are all concepts that are related together. And so we, it's not just a, a good idea to do this. It's required by the standard to, to ensure that there's integration between these efforts. It will improve effectiveness and it will improve efficiency. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Other questions? Um, I guess, again, um, compliments to the staff. Uh, the, the phenomenon that was noted in the um, inspection reports often was the disturbing tendency of uh, broker dealers to uh, be preparing uh, financial information for their client, uh, a fundamental aspect of the independence um, issue. And I, I assume that, or I, w I would be interested in hearing your views as to whether any there's any reason to think that with these standards, with the kind of refocus that you're talking about, um, is it to be hoped and expected that perhaps that too will get us will get a, a fresh look and uh, fresh consideration by brokers, and that the auditors will not be preparing their financial information. Your representation that the information comes from the books and records of the auditor or of the of the, issue of the uh, broker dealer is relevant here. There are also requirements for the in the compliance and the review in, engagement for them to uh, specific steps for them to evaluate independence. So that's a that's another prop to go back and make sure that they're not doing things that would violate the independence rules. Well, with that, um, unless there are further questions from the board, I think it's time to to call the question of the staff's recommendation on the standards pre being presented and the transmission to the SEC. And all in favor of approving that recommendation, please say yes. Yes, yes. yes. And none opposed? You are uh, authorized. And, uh, thank you. The meeting uh, is now uh, concluded. Uh, that's our agenda.
Uh, there's no further business. We will adjourn, and uh, I suggest we give ourselves um, until uh, 45 uh, after 10, maybe to, uh, 10.45, to uh, reconvene here for a closed meeting. Thank you all. Thank you.